So the last thing we're going to do with uh, viruses in lecture six is look through how influenza virus works. So we're going to look at how it replicates. It's usually for the best to look at a specific example to allow us to kind of put the generalities in place. So if you're having a little bit of trouble following my wordy slides about negative sense single-stranded RNA viruses, here is one, and we will see in detail what it does, and it, pictures will be worth lots of words. What's going to happen after this is we will learn about prions, which are totally different and terrifying. So um, this is probably the second to last video, and then prions, and then somewhere, if I have time, I will make another video about how the SARS-CoV-2 virus replicates in our host cells. This is not where I'm going to tell you what influenza is like as a disease. I'm not going to describe pandemics. I'm not going to talk about our immunity to it or vaccines. That's coming in Unit 4, and I'm going to do um, COVID in Unit 4 also. Here, we're really trying to understand what viruses are and how they work. Uh, this is our only really chance to dig into viral biology, and I desperately want my students to know what viruses are when they leave my class. So here we go. Um, influenza is a disease caused by the influenza virus. It's contagious and acute. It does spread in outbreaks. Um, each different government has its own way of defining what an epidemic is. So sometimes there are epidemics, sometimes there aren't. Um, it's a member of the Orthomyxoviridae family. It is enveloped helical and negative sense um, single-stranded RNA genome. What we're going to see is it has a segmented genome. There are eight genome segments, and each one has its own capsid. And that's why we're going to, well, I'll show you. The three major groups of influ influenza viruses, the ones that cause the pandemics that we think about, like that we're very afraid of a lot of the time are influenza A viruses. B viruses cause um, seasonal outbreaks. And so if you get uh, the trivalent um, influenza vaccine, it's usually two A strains and one B strain. C viruses don't seem to cause serious infections, so we don't think about them very much. Okay, so what is in an influenza virus virion? As we expect, there's negative sense RNA, so it doesn't directly encode anything. We would need to have its reverse complement to actually encode genes. Um, it's segmented, so there are eight segments, and what that means is if two different influenza viruses infect the same cell, like imagine a bird flu virus and a human flu virus infect the same cell, they can swap those segments. It's they're you could think of them like like our own chromosomes, where we have 23 different chromosomes. They have eight different genome segments. And that is a thing we'll talk about later. Each segment is part of a nucleocapsid, and that, that is uh, proteins that protect each segment. Um, there are two spike proteins, the H and the N. Um, H is hemagglutinin, which is the um, receptor for salic acids and the uh, neuraminidase, which is an enzyme that degrades mucin. Because this, this um, influenza is going to infect our ciliated, um, our ciliated epithelial cells in our upper respiratory tract, and so it has to get through um, mucus. So neuraminidase helps with that, and neuraminidase is going to help it um, during release. Influenza virions have an envelope, and they have a protein matrix that is like a big capsid right next to the envelope. So here is an influenza virion in a cute little cartoon. Um, they've drawn the two different spikes, H and N, and you, you might remember H1N1, H5N1. Those numbers refer to the type of these two um, spike proteins. And then... This is the um, 
This is the envelope, which was stolen from a host cell. And inside this, this is the matrix. We haven't talked much about matrix, but it's just a protein shell that protects everything on the inside, and it gives a nice anchoring point for these um, spike proteins. And then inside of that, in the core, so to speak, are the eight genome segments, each one wrapped up in its own, um, in its own set of proteins. And I'll show you what these are like in more detail later. This is the big diagram we're going to look at to understand influenza virus replication, and I'll show you it bit by bit. So um, the more you look at it, the more you'll get it. The way, um, the way textbooks tend to draw these processes is they draw the first steps over here, and then they draw later steps here, and the last steps over here, and then it's the end. So this is um, attachment. Uh, penetration and uncoating, biosynthesis, maturation, release. That's what's going on. So first we look at attachment. This is where neuraminidase is going to help get through the mucus. Um, the hemagglutinin is going to actually bind the surface receptors and the host cell um, is going to ingest uh, this whole thing through receptor mediated endocytosis. Um, that will put this inside an endosome or inside a vesicle. Remember, whenever we bring something in through endocytosis, it's inside a vesicle. Um, and um, one of the things we do is we acidify the inside of those vesicles. Um, and so once that starts to happen, one of the um, proteins in the envelope that we haven't discussed, the N2, M2 proton channel, it allows the core it allows protons from that acidifying endosome to get into the core. And what that does is acidify the inside and that helps separate the nucleocapsids from the matrix. So that helps, if we go back, let's see, that helps these separate from this. And that's going to let um, the virus uncoat. It's going to release the nucleocapsids. In this case, uncoating doesn't involve like removing. Um, in this case, in this case, uncoating is mainly getting rid of the, the matrix. That's m mostly what we're paying attention to, and that releases nucleocapsids. This is a nucleocapsid. This is a RNA genome segment with all the stuff that's attached to it. So, what is attached to it? Well. The um, nucleoprotein is most of it. This is a capsomere protein that protects the, the RNA. That's its job. This is a negative sense single-strand RNA virus. So this is negative sense RNA. It cannot be translated. It must be, a, a positive sense copy must be made or a positive sense reverse complement must be made um, before anything else can happen. And that's what these enzymes are going to do. So these are three different enzymes that work together to do all the different little steps that have to happen in order to start making um, a reverse complement. Um, so that's uh, PB1, PB2, and PA. Those are different um, polymerase basic number two, polymerase basic number one, polymerase acidic. I don't know basic acidic, I don't know the details there, but the three of them work together to do all of the um, all of the nucleic acid synthesis that it does. Biosynthesis is where we expect this to be kind of gnarly because um, it's a negative sense single-stranded virus. So buckle up, we're doing this, and it's not as bad as you think. Or maybe I'm the only one who thinks it's bad. I'm the only one who's scared of this. Um, you are a um, you're a very knowledgeable cell biology person. Okay, so this is viral RNA. This is the RNA that came in as part of a nucleocapsid. So this was in the virion, or this is what is going to be put into a new virion. So this is the the RNA that goes in a virion. So it's negative sense, um, what do you call it? Negative sense, single-stranded RNA. Um, 
In order to do any translation, we have to make a reverse complement, or influenza virus has to make a reverse complement, so it uses these little enzymes to make a reverse complement, that, and that ends up acting as messenger RNA that is sent out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. How did all this get into the nucleus? I don't know how that works. I don't know. It's complicated. Um, I have no idea how anything gets into a human cell nucleus. It's Someday when I'm older, I will um, read all about that. Anyway, messenger RNA gets pushed out of the nucleus where it can be grabbed by ribosomes. Some ribosomes are free-floating in the cytoplasm and others are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. And the ones that are in the cytoplasm are going to make cytoplasmic proteins that can just hang out in the cytoplasm. The ones attached to the endoplasmic reticulum are going to put enzymes in the um, membrane of the cytoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum, sorry. And then these are ultimately going to be sent to the Golgi in vesicles. And so all of these are destined for uh, the cell membrane, or at least vesicles. So that was what we've talked about. Um, these enzymes make the reverse complement, which is messenger RNA, and that can lead to synthesis of all these proteins. But we, uh, the virus also wants more viral RNA. It wants to make lots of copies of itself. So it needs to make lots of copies of this molecule. To do that, it has to make a complementary strand like messenger RNA, but it doesn't actually use this to make the copies. It makes what we call a copy RNA, which is the same as this, except that, um, it doesn't get used as messenger RNA. It only exists as a template for making more of this. So this is the reverse complement that allows the virus to make many copies. Um, so at this point, you should be able to explain where every object here came from. Not what it's going to do or what its purpose is, but you should be able to explain where every part of this came from and how it got where it is. So I've just gone through everything on here and how it got where it is. So by the end of biosynthesis, um, all of these viral proteins are in the cytoplasm. All these viral proteins are in the endoplasmic reticulum and there's viral RNA being made in huge quantities in the nucleus. Um, this is This is a critical thing that many different viruses have to do. It turns out messenger RNAs need to have five prime caps. And also, um, in order to make reverse complements, they have to have a primer. They have to have a first base laid down that they can use to add the bases to as they make a new nucleic acid. And um, they do all of this together. So what you're looking at here, what, what you're looking at here is um, this is a nucleocapsid. So this is a genome segment with the three different um, polymerase enzymes attached to it and the protective um, enzymes on the RNA. And this is a cellular messenger RNA. This is one of our RNAs with a five prime cap and a poly A tail. Well, influenza has the enzymatic activity to steal the five prime cap from one of our RNAs and use it as a primer to start its own um, synthesis of the um, its own RNA. So that's how it makes the viral RNA and it has a five prime cap that it stole from this cellular messenger RNA. This is really common in viruses. Lots of them do what we call cap snatching. And this is just one example I wanted to give you of the things I haven't really talked about, of the more complicated things viruses have to do. Um, and the more you learn about viruses, the more you have to learn more and more and more about viruses to understand what's going on. Um, right, so influenza steals the cap. It's cool. It's clever. 
it sucks for the host cell, which, because remember what the five prime cap does is it makes the messenger RNA stable and it helps it get translated. And now this messenger RNA is not stable and it will not get translated. Um, so that was all part of biosynthesis. So cap snatching was part of biosynthesis and all of this transcription, translation, RNA copying, that was biosynthesis. Now we look at maturation and assembly. So there are two kind of pathways, two kind of things happening here. One of them is all of this stuff. Well, what do we have here? We have NP, we've seen that before, that's the nucleoprotein. We have basic polymerase 1, polymerase basic 2, polymerase acidic. These are part of the nucleocapsid. So these are all going to get trafficked back into the nucleus where they're going to associate with the viral RNA. Fair enough. So they're made in the cytoplasm because that's where the host makes proteins. And then they get sent somehow, I don't really know how that works, back to the, um, the nucleus. Two other proteins, the, the matrix protein and another protein, I'm not sure what this one does, they're going to get attached to each genome segment. And um, these are all going to be attached to a, a vesicle of some kind that is going to be sent to the cell membrane. And so this is a process that is kind of outside of basic cell biology. I'm not sure what I'm not sure what this what these things are hijacking to make this happen. But ultimately they assemble the the nucleocapsids here with all the enzymes that have to be attached to it and the matrix protein. And then they send those to the cell membrane. Um, and so the matrix proteins are going to start making this um, spherical shape, and they're going to start attaching to the nucleocapsids. And think about how tricky this is. There are eight different genome segments, and it needs exactly one of each. So it has to somehow be able to figure out which ones it has. And this is happening all over the cell. There might be 50 different versions of this happening at the same time. Um, and they all have to figure out exactly which segments go to um, which virion. Up here, you're seeing the normal um, protein trafficking for membrane-bound proteins. You're seeing the endoplasmic reticulum is where they're made. And through vesicles, they're sent to the Golgi. And they're organized in the Golgi. And through vesicles, they are sent to the um, cell membrane. And so that's the spike proteins we're seeing here. That's um, neuraminidase and hemagglutinin. And then the M2 proton channel would be put somewhere in um, the membrane here. So that's maturation and assembly. After you work through this, um, I don't expect you to understand exactly how this works, but the end product is keep track of what these proteins do and where they go. Um, and then this you should understand because this is how proteins, how normal host proteins get to the, the membrane through the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi. And then the last thing is release. Um, this matrix makes a full um, sphere and this part of the membrane touches this part and the virion is free. So it's it's a lot of stuff to work through if you're rusty on your cell biology, um, but it's, it's elegant and what it does is give us a window into kind of how our own cells work and um, the fact that there are extra proteins here, like why are there three polymerases? Why is there this extra protein? That gives us a sense of what other challenges um, the virus might have to be solving. With most viruses, we have learned how to sequence their genomes, and that is, that's the most information we get about them. That's the fastest way we can learn about them. We can figure out what their genome encodes. But viruses are so compact and so efficient, and they evolve so fast, they come up with new solutions to problems. They will have, in many cases, genes that encode proteins, and we have no idea what those proteins do. It takes a lot of 
study and investigation to figure these things out, and in many cases we will never know. Um, so there's a lot of mystery you encounter if you study a virus in detail. And if you read virology literature, it is as deep into cell biology, biochemistry, and genetics as you can possibly get. So anyway, to wrap this up, uh, influenza is a great example of viral replication. And the main reason I pick this is that it is so well known, but it's also the most important virus we can study. Part of the reason for that is that influenza does tend to cause pandemics. Every roughly 15 years, there is an influenza pandemic. And the recent ones have been in the news, but they, they certainly haven't been as disruptive as COVID. But we, we know in 1918, there was an influenza pandemic that was worse than COVID. And throughout history, there have been worse pandemics than that from influenza. So we really need to stay on top of influenza and keep our eyes on it uh, so that we can stop the next pandemic before it starts. Okay, enough about that. Um, one thing that you need to be able to do if you've taken a microbiology class is tell people the difference between bacteria and viruses. So in this slide, I line up some differences between them. And what your task is here is to understand these things so that you could explain this entire table to someone. So for example, the first line would be obligate intracellular parasite. Some bacteria are that way, all viruses are that way. Well, what is obligate intracellular parasite? You should be able to define that in your own words. You should also be able to explain why for plasma membrane, we say bacteria, yes, they have them, but viruses sort of have them because they have envelopes. Those could be identical to parts of a plasma membrane, but they don't have the same function as a plasma membrane. Do they replicate by binary fission? Bacteria do, viruses do not. That is a critical difference. That to me is the fundamental difference between them. It's how do they reproduce? Bacteria grow and divide. Viruses are assembled at full size inside the host cell. Um, this one is interesting to biologists and biochemists. And when people have, or historically when people were doing early research into viruses, what they realized was that you could filter water and remove the bacteria from it, but a lot of those filters would let the viruses pass through. That's just another way of saying viruses, or virions in particular, tend to be much smaller than any kind of cell. This is another one. I want you to think through this. Why would we expect to find both DNA and RNA in a bacterial cell, but not in a virion? Why do we think bacteria can generate ATP, but viruses can't? Um, why would a virus need to make ATP? And then would a virus make its own proteins? The vast majority of viruses don't need to. Okay, so that's enough um, of these. This is really important. Uh, this is one of the two most important things you can learn from a microbiology class. So the other I'll talk about from time to time. So now we're going to shift gears and we're going to talk about prions. And prions are not like anything else we've studied. They're not viruses. They're not cells. They are worse. So you'll see that in the next video.